Well, good afternoon and welcome to H360 Live. My name is Dave Duplay and Cortland Long is not with us today. She is off on vacation, enjoying the holiday season. So Kimberly, it's so good to see you. We've got a great show for everybody today. Kimberly Holloway is here with us in the studio and we're going to be talking about folks who are deaf or hard of hearing. And this is gonna be a great show because Kimberly knows a lot about this subject. She grew up actually in a house, her father was deaf and she had two deaf grandparents. So she's got a lot of information to share with us. She now works at the Clark County School District, which is one of the largest school districts in the country, doing great work. Kimberly's also on Capitol Hill as a lobbyist. She's a consultant. She is a global advocate for the deaf and hard of hearing. Kimberly, it's so good to see you. Thank you so much. So I have to ask you, I'm, I'm fascinated because you grow up in a house and your father's deaf. You have two deaf grandparents. What was that like as a child? So it was a great experience. Um, I was, I grew up bilingual. Both of my grandparents are deaf on both sides and my father's deaf. Um, we did, I did see a lot of oppression. Um, I really felt that um, it's a lack of knowledge that the general public had. Um, a lot of times my friends would think, wow, what's wrong with your dad? And you know, because he didn't talk very well because he used American Sign Language as his main form of communication. Uh, they would ask, oh, he has a driver's license? Oh, he can read? And so, you know, I found myself a lot of times having to defend him. But at the same time, it was I had a rich, great childhood with language. I'm bilingual. I can speak English and, and sign American Sign Language, and it was, it's amazing. It's blessed me. So was your father born deaf, or did he lose his hearing later in life? So that's a really good question. Um, typically, 90% of deaf people that are born are born from hearing parents, and they become deaf later. It's usually not genetic. There's about 10% that are. My dad actually is one that is genetic. His both of my grandparents were deaf, his brother's deaf, and my father was deaf. Now my mother, on the other hand, her parents were both deaf, but they were deaf after birth. And so when they got together and they had my mother and my aunts and uncles, they were hearing because it wasn't a genetic reason. Yeah. So, you know, in my house growing up, I always knew, and I was a very anxious child growing up. I was always in some mischief or some, and I always knew when my father was upset with me because his voice would go up, but your father signs. Did you know you were in trouble by the way your father would sign at you? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> his signs got a lot bigger and his face <laughs> expressions were a lot more vivid. So, yeah, and he did raise his voice. Um, so, oh, I knew immediately when dad was mad, definitely. <laughs> so there's this thing called um, latent death. Um, tell me a little bit about that term and what it means. So, uh, in the deaf community, we have big D deaf, which is deaf people that identify themselves through the sign language and the culture, um, and they typically ha were deaf earlier on in their life and are very involved in that culture. Latent deaf typically means a person, baby boomers right now, are looking at being hard of hearing. They're losing their hearing slowly as they age. And so because the baby boomers are such a large population, we're seeing a lot of that right now. So, so the, you're right, the, you know, the baby boomers are getting older. Um, they're losing their hearing. So obviously there's a big need for interpreters, for people that can sign. What do you see, you, you do a lot of work in the Clark County School District. Tell me some of the work that you're doing there and you know, how does that kind of shape you know, what you're doing in the school district at Clark County, how does that shape some of the other school districts around the country? So currently, um, I work in the school district with about 250 deaf and hard of hearing students that use sign language. There's about another 250 deaf students that use oral for communication. Um, I work with uh, a team of interpreters that go into the classroom. Um, they're certified interpreters. They will actually interpret what's going on between the teacher and the students, so the lessons. Um, we have a self-contained programs throughout the school, so we're very large. Um, we also work a lot with the little kids, you know, providing them language, working with their families, 
Um, a lot of kids now are implanted with cochlear implants, and so we really encourage both the use of sound and using sign language so we can bridge that, that gap for language acquisition that seems to happen with kids that are born uh, and become deaf at an early age. So, you know, you, you hit on something that I'm fascinated with, the cochlear implant, and I'm interested to know your opinion. You know, technology plays a large role in our lives, not just for folks who are deaf and hard of hearing, but it, technology plays a role in my life, a role in your life. And, you know, if you go back to some of the old movies, you know, and you'd see somebody with a cone up to their ear, yeah. right? They're deaf or hard, you know, hard of hearing. And then, you know, comes the, the hearing aid. And I remember seeing people when I was a child with hearing aids, you know, around their neck, wearing a, a pretty large box yeah. with a wire running from that box up to their ear. Um, and now we have hearing aids that you can barely see. Yeah, they're, digital. They're digital hearing yes. aids. Do you see technology playing a big role? And how does technology, from your perspective, evolved to help the deaf and hard of hearing? So that's a really good question because I think um, there's some um, misconception of what the cochlear implant can provide a deaf person. So a cochlear implant, when implanted um, at an early age, actually um, there's an electronic node that goes into the cochlea and it, and it kills the nerves that are in there and then there's going to be an electronic pulse and you're going to be able to hear sounds and you are taught how to listen. So you have to have, it's computer, you have to have, make sure you always have batteries, you have to make sure that you go in and you get that mapped. And what that means is when, at the end of the day, if the cochlear implant's taken off, you're profoundly deaf. So cochlear implants don't make you become a hearing person, but they are, technology is amazing. And I, I for one, I have nothing against cochlear implants, I think it's really great, but I think there's also, a need for not only having the cochlear implant and learning how to listen and learning voc language through a technology paired with using sign language to get that foundation. Yeah. I want to go back to the baby boomers for a minute because I, I'm one of them, right? And we are getting older. Um, and so, you know, as we get older and as we age, there's more visits to the doctor's office. And I would imagine that, you know, when I'm, I'm just thinking in my own experience, my own doctor's office, um, I'm not sure if there's a person in my doctor's office that can sign. Um, are there certain rules and regulations or laws that, that are in place to help people who are deaf or hard of hearing? Yes. When they go into a doctor's office, say, for example? Yes. So it's a really good question. So under the ADA law, it states that whatever form of communication is necessary for a deaf person to be able to communicate with their doctor, a business, whatever it needs to be happening, whatever communication needs to be fluid. So typically late deaf and people do not know sign language. They've had English, they've been able to speak their whole lives. But when they go into the doctor's office, they might not be able to hear that doctor so well. It might be really difficult for them. So some form of communication that would probably go on is maybe writing back and forth, maybe having somebody come in and typing the information out for them, um, a lot of repeating, looking directly into the patient's eyes, speaking normally, clearly. That would typically be what a late deafened adult would probably use as a support for their doctor's appointment. Whereas deaf people who use American Sign Language as their main form of communication typically need to have, have an interpreter hired that will come into the doctor's office and interpret that uh, situation. Sometimes writing back and forth isn't always clear since American Sign Language is not an English form of, is not language. I mean, it's language, excuse me, is language, it's just not English. It's American Sign Language. So typically, users of American Sign Language, English is their second language. And so writing back and forth sometimes just isn't really clear. It would just be like somebody coming from another country into the doctor's office and trying to speak with them that way. It's just not gonna work. So that's why we have American Sign Language interpreters that are provided for doctor's appointments, hospital visits, emergency visits, anytime. And they can request that at the front and, and let their doctor know that that's something that they need. So you raise a couple of good points here. Um, 
Let's, let's talk about the baby boomers again, um, because, you know, as we're getting old or older, right, no one wants to admit we're losing our hearing, right? There's a lot of denial. Um, what are some of the things that we need to look out for when, you know, a, a friend or a colleague or a spouse, significant other, what are some of the signs that the hearing loss may be an issue? So oftentimes we'll notice that the TV's going up a little bit louder. A lot of, can you please repeat that? What, what? Oftentimes phone conversations are very difficult to have. So, um, and when family members start identifying that and, and the person themselves notice that they're getting, you know, a hearing loss, you know, it's really time to go to see an audiologist and it's time to, to consider getting fitted for hearing aids. It's time to start considering different devices that can help your life uh, get a lot easier. For instance, a doorbell ringer. Um, they've got doorbell ringers that the lights come on so they know somebody's at the door. Um, they have alarms that are bed shakers. Instead of the sound of the alarm, it shakes the bed to get you up. I mean, there's a lot of different um, technologies that can help make that your life a lot easier. Um, and know that there's so many people with a hearing loss that there's a lot of support. Yeah. You refer to the sign language as American Sign Language. So I'm, I'm curious, when you, when you know American Sign Language, the way that you would sign, like say, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. In American Sign Language, okay. is that sign different, let's say, in Japan or in France or another country? Oh, every country has their own form of sign language. There's even a universal sign language that's used um, globally, which is a lot more gestures. But what's interesting is American Sign Language is really um, based from French Sign Language. A lot of French Sign Language was adapted and then American Sign Language was, was uh, it grew from there. British Sign Language, we both speak English, correct? That's the Brits English and in American English. Their sign system is completely different than ours. So it's really interesting how even because we both speak English, their sign systems are not the same. So if you if you went to another country, for example, and you were you you communicated by American Sign Language, is there enough of a similarity that you might be able to get by? You know, when I when I visit Japan, for example, you know, there's I have to go with somebody that's local or because there's just no way of getting around for me, because you know, the the, the symbols that they use to communicate are, you know, I'm not trained in that versus if I'm in Germany, for example, or I'm in France, and I'm driving down the road, and I can kind of phonetically pronounce something and right. kind of make it out. Is that the same way with signing? So sign language is really, there's a lot of basics, right? And a lot of sign language isn't the sign itself as much as it's the body language and the facial communication. So if you say um, house, right, you would think house. I mean, that looks like a house. So there's a lot of ways you can communicate with people, just gesturing, pointing, no, yes. So, and I think we do that just as, as hearing people when we're trying to communicate with somebody that de doesn't use our same language. So there are similarities as far as that's concerned, but to have a full on conversation with somebody from another, uh, if two deaf people came together and they were trying to talk, it's a lot more gesture than it would be signs that are similar. Now you, you talked to me earlier about early detection and this, you know, the, a baby in the hospital now gets checked for yes. hearing. Tell me a little about that technology and how does that work? So um, it's a law now that when babies are born that they are tested for, their, for any type of hearing loss when, before they leave the hospital. So in Nevada, um, what happens is the babies are born, the parents are told if they pass the screening or they don't pass the screening. After that, then it's the parents' responsibility to get followed up with. And oftentimes when babies are born and they are detected with some type of a hearing loss, parents are very uh, grief strucken. It's very difficult to be aware that, you know, now your baby is broken in their, in their mind. You know, their perfect child is, uh, there's something wrong with them. What are we going to do? And it's almost a grief process that they go through. It's really, um, it's, it's really hard, but they have a lot of resources. One of the resources that is national is, um, the, um, hands and voices. 
and Hands and Voices actually in Nevada, they're able to get a list of those babies that are detected early and they reach out to the families and they give the support that they need and the options and the things that they need to look for to be able to start your child early with language. Mm -hmm. So how does the uh, how does it work? I mean, uh, so obviously a newborn baby before they leave the hospital can't raise their no. hand or communicate in some way. <laughs> right. says, I hear you or right. I, I don't hear you. How right. does that work? So it's actually a device that they put on your brain and they detect brain waves with sound. Mm. Mm. So it automatically lets them know if there's, if there's registering any sound through the brain activity. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about, you mentioned, I think, the ADA. Mm -hmm. um, and I would imagine they're the body that, you know, they're advocates for the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, what are some of the other things that they do to try to either, you know, pass laws for the deaf or hard of hearing? Or, you know, as an employer, what are some of the responsibilities or things that an employer, I know you do a lot of consulting with organizations on, um, you know, what's available and wh how they should handle employees who are deaf or hard of hearing. What are, what are some of those things that, you know, the ADA is working on to help um, employers? So the American with Disabilities Act um, actually provides um, laws that state that deaf people um, are able to communicate effectively with a hearing person via whatever mode necessary. So um, I work a lot with people that are profoundly deaf and that use American Sign Language as their main form of communication. And um, they, employers will hire an interpreter, but it would, be, it would just depend. The, I mean, typically I've been in interpreting situations where the deaf person works for the company and they needed to have a communication with their boss and an interpreter would come in or they would have a meeting, a staff meeting, and an interpreter would come in. But the interpreter's not gonna be with them all day long, right? Mm -hmm. So, but if there's some important information that needs to be given, then an interpreter would come. We have deaf people that are attorneys, doctors, dentists, and so often, and a lot of people in IT, a lot of deaf people work in IT. So, um, the American with Disabilities Act gives those deaf people the ability to have an interpreter come, and they are legally, they're legally supported to be able to get that. Um, they're also, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, there's a, um, a communications law for telephone use. Before we used to have a TTY where it was a text-based right. system. Sure, I remember. And now we have video phones. So it's really, really great where you have a deaf person that uses sign language and they're at home and they have their television they have their video phone come on, they call into an operating office where an interpreter will be there with their video phone on, and then they will make their phone calls. And if the, the communication is very fluid, it's really real time. In fact, the deaf person can identify if they're deaf or not, it's up to them, they don't even have to. And you know, doctor's office calls, uh, social security calls, calls to your friend late at night, so it's, it's a, it's a system that's set up by um, the FCC, actually, and it's reimbursed by the government. So, you know, Kimberly, I hear quite often that, um, you know, people that will lose one of their senses, their other senses will, I'm not sure what the right word is, kind of kick into overdrive and, and compensate for that. Do you, do you see that to be true when somebody loses their hearing? Do you kind of notice that maybe their eyesight's a little sharper or... You know, some, uh, some one of their other senses yes. is really kind of, you know, working so, overdrive here. Yes. So that's a funny story because my father, growing up, could smell anything. And, then, uh. <laughs> and it was like, he'd walk in and could tell immediately if something was different just by the smell of the room. Yeah. So his senses were, were very sharp. Um, another thing is <clears throat> that it's proven that deaf drivers are safer drivers. Is than that hearing, right? Yes, than hearing people. So uh, they did, they've done several studies, and deaf drivers actually have less accidents because they're more aware of what's going on. Their line of sight is a little bit wider, and they, it, they don't get in as many accidents as we do. They're, they're cheaper to insure. They have cheaper insurance than we do. <laughs> wow. Huh. I, I would have never guessed that, right? Mm -hmm. Because to me, driving a, a large part of that, especially lane changes and things, 
you know, in the use of the horn, um, you hear that and you know, okay, there's something I need to be aware of here. So that's a, a very interesting um, statistic. It's a fact. So <clears throat> I noticed lately, I, I do a lot of walking in Manhattan, and, and it seems like I see everybody now with their smartphone and they're wearing these earbuds in their, their ears. Occasionally I'll get on an elevator in a building here in New York coming to work or uh, at my apartment and somebody in the elevator will be playing music and they might be standing three or two or three feet away from me, but I can hear that music clear as a bell. What should, what should parents look out for or you know, be aware of when you know, they might be out buying a gift for their child or their spouse or significant other in terms of headphones? Are there some headphones, are the, the over the ears better than the earbuds putting them deep into the ear? Tell me a little about that. So um, the statistics show now that teenagers um, are experiencing hearing loss 30% more than they did in the 80s and the 90s because of headphones. So um, whether it's over your ear or it's in your ear, is a 60 decibel limit is what you really should look at and not go any higher than that for over 60 minutes a day. And, or you can damage your hearing. Um, another rule of thumb would be if you have your headphones in, either in your ears or over your ears, and you cannot hear anything outside of that, and you can only hear the music because it's that loud, then it's too loud. Hmm. What about ambient noise? Um, you know, I, I see a lot, I travel quite a bit, I see a lot of uh, people on um, the airplanes now wearing these Bose noise-canceling headphones. Do you think those, do you think there's something to that? Do you think they work or? Well, <clears throat> it's, um, I think it really helps a lot of people who, who get distracted easy and have a lot of sound in the background and they can't really focus. But yeah, I mean, they work fine. Yeah. I'll do you have, have, do you have I, a pair? I, I, I don't, but I, now I'm going to run out and get a pair of those. <laughs> it might help you when you fly. <laughs> Tell me, what are some online resources? Are, are there, you, you mentioned one, um, Hands and Voices, for Hands example. And Voice, Hands and Voices is a great organization. They're actually a family support organization, and they are nation, nationwide. Um, there's a website called the National Association for the Deaf, NAD.org, which is huge, and there is a lot of resources on there. Um, you can go on there and learn, and they support everybody from birth, early detection, all the way to a lot of, like we said, baby boomers that are late deafened. And there's information on there, there's support, there's uh, referrals, there's everything that you need to know about deafness, late deafened, hard of hearing, that is a great website to go to. So with all the technology advancements and all the, the, the work you know that the ADA is doing, what do you want people to know about folks who are, you know, what's, what's the one takeaway that you want our audience to know about people who are deaf or hard of hearing? So the first thing is, is deaf people can do anything a hearing person can do. Anything. And there's no reason to be afraid to communicate with them. There's no reason to be um, fearful at all with trying to have a conversation. So often I've noticed that when I was growing up and we would sign and we were in public, people would, they shy away from us. Um, but deaf people are just like anybody else that can hear and they just want to have communication and friendships and, and whatever they can as well, just like we do. So I would say the important thing would be is to talk directly to them. Don't over-exaggerate your mouth. Don't yell and scream. That's always a good one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi! <laughs> yeah. So, um, I would say that just know that they're able to do anything that anybody else can do. Give them a chance, talk to them, um, and just be more open. Yeah, excellent words of advice. Well, Kimberly, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I'd like to thank our viewers for tuning in, and I'd like to thank our sponsors for making this all possible. Remember, all of our episodes can be viewed on demand at HealthyO360.com, and our podcast can be found in the iTunes Store. Well, as you know, we're all about social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. We use the hashtag Real Stories, and we'd appreciate it if you would do the same when tweeting and posting. On behalf of myself and the entire Healthy O360 family, we look forward to seeing you again next week. 